everybody doing? Are we good? My mic on, everybody hear me? I love the energy in this room. I've been here since this morning. I, and by the way, okay, so I've never been to Idaho before, um, and it's so beautiful, and I loved just looking out the window when I was coming in yesterday. And I want you all to know at the top that my wife is so jealous that I get to be here. She never can, I mean, I'm fortunate that I, I get invited to speak around the world. I was just supposed to be in the Caribbean last week. She didn't even blink, she didn't care. But when I got this invitation, she said, no fair, take me with you. But the weekend didn't work out, so I've already promised I'm gonna come back with the family next year. Um, and by the way, did anybody notice I just said Boise, not Boise? I know this stuff matters. It's not Jay-Z's brother, Boy Z. It's Boy C. It's a thing. When I started my career on NPR in Atlanta, um, I, we, the local station got angry calls from people because I didn't know that you're not supposed to pronounce the second T. And I was saying, I'm Josh Lebs in Atlanta. And when they heard the ta, they were furious. So I had to learn to say Atlanta. So trust me, I know this stuff matters. Uh, we got fun stuff to talk about today. We really do. But um, I'm going to start off with a segment that I did um, on HLN, and when you see this, you might not know at first, you won't see clearly at first why it's so important to the cause of advancing women, but then I'm going to show you. So just, just trust me on this. Um, can you guys take this? I'm, I'm going to start over here, and I'm going to show you the first couple minutes of this one segment that I did with one of the anchors on uh, one of our, our CNN networks, which is uh, HLN. Here it goes. Being a dad, I just love this story, and, and thankfully some dads took action. Basically, what do they want for Father's Day? Uh, for the media to stop portraying dads as buffoons, doofus dads, right? I mean, like, that's all we ever see. It's not just one or two shows, it's practically every show. And Josh Lebs joins us now. And Josh, yeah. you and I are both dads. You've got little ones, i got yeah. teenagers. And enough's enough, and I love it that some dads stood up. It's so true, isn't it? You, you, almost, you can't avoid the caricature of us as dads as being these complete idiots who can't understand how to do anything. Nothing. Often who don't know how to take care of We're our We're practically another kid in the home in most TV shows. But just so everyone knows, this isn't, this isn't a wine session. I mean, what, what's so interesting <laughs> to me is that dads are doing something about this yeah. now. They're standing up and fighting, and I, I have some proof that they're making a difference. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with an ad that aired earlier this year that was just obviously offensive. Take a look here. To prove Huggies diapers and wipes can handle anything, we put them to the toughest test imaginable. Dads, alone with their babies, in one house for five days. Okay, so in that ad, Huggy said the, the 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 biggest test imaginable is to, for diapers is to leave kids we alone can't with dads. Right? Oh, of course not. Ew, gross, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, they had another one where the dads didn't change the diapers throughout an entire game on double overtime. So what happened here is a bunch of dads got together. They started petitioning online. That one guy started a petition. A lot of people complained online. Huggies took it really seriously. They jumped on it. They said, "Whoa, this was not what we meant." They called one of the dads. They pulled two ads. They replaced them with brand new ads. And here's one of the new ones. Take Awesome. To prove Huggies wipes can handle anything, we asked real dads to put them to the test with their own babies on spaghetti night. Totally different message there. We asked dads to put them to the test. And you see this happening elsewhere dad's as well. Dad's cooking as well. Dad's He's preparing cooking, a meal. Dad's feeding. And so I started to talk to some pop culture analysts and some right, dads. You don't need my pop saying, culture you know, analysis. That's fine. So, um, so... But so when these ads pop up, it, it's I almost have always uh, I think every case I've heard from more women than I have from men. Women complaining about it. Did you see that ad? Lives go do something. It's so offensive. Now it used to be that when I would talk about this stuff on air or online, that we would also get a lot of angry comments. Which you know I have this line: anything you do in public, there's always someone to get angry about. But in this particular case, a lot of them were getting angry because they would say, just relax, take a joke, it's not a big deal. But what they didn't understand was that this is a symptom. It's a symptom of a very serious problem that lies at the core of our culture. And it's not the most serious symptoms. There are far more serious symptoms that come from the same problem. And this right here is one of them. This is a look at what goes on with women in the modern workforce. It's incredible what's happening. Women are entering the workforce at about 50% of the workforce, slightly more soon as we uh, see more and more women get higher degrees. And as you go up the ranks into these higher levels in the workplace, women disappear. They're just uh, less than 5% of the CEOs are women. This is also 
a symptom. Now, I grew up on this album, and I don't know if you guys have heard of it. When I was growing up, there was this album called Free to Be You and Me. Has anybody heard of it? All right, a few people. So it was about gender equality. It was about this whole idea. Boys grow up and girls grow up, and we can all change diapers, and we can all work, and we can all clean the floor at home. And it just seemed so obvious and natural to me. You know, and when I, the girls I knew growing up were just as smart and capable and driven in every way. And that was the same in college. I went to Yale. I'm surrounded by brilliant women there, I went into the workplace assuming what most of us do, that that kind of equality would continue, that of course it would come to fruition. Here I am in my mid-40s, 20 years later, and this is where we are. Now, why is that? Well, it's because of a problem I'm going to tell you about, but even that is not the most serious symptom. This is the most serious symptom, that we are the only nation in, with any kind of developed economy, almost the only nation in the world, that doesn't make sure that when a baby is born, it can have a parent at home and some food on the table for at least a block of weeks. It's literally just us in the developed world and almost just us in the entire world. And it's something that I experienced. That's me holding my tiny little preemie daughter when she was born. I'm gonna be telling you my story about why I couldn't stay home and care for her or my sick wife. All of it comes from this. It all comes from Mad Men. This is where all this stuff comes from, <laughs> the whole thing. It literally, like, this show, it summarizes. I don't even watch the show, and I still know that this is where it comes from. You know, it's important to understand where we are. Sometimes you just got to, like, pull back and take a look at society. We created this new America after World War II. All of a sudden, we were this superpower, and this whole idea was coming about. What does it mean to be an American family now? What does it mean to be successful in America? What does it mean to be successful in an American corporation? What does that look like? And it was designed based on a very clear, gendered idea. Woman and baby at home, man at work. And everything was designed that way. So you know, part of what I've learned, for example, is that when huge businesses have on-site childcare, it actually makes the business more money because people come back to work sooner, they want to work there, they stay there, they're willing to pay more for on-site childcare than they are to have to take their kids all the way across town. But virtually zero businesses have on-site childcare, even though it's a profit maker. Well, why is that? Of course they don't have them. Because woman and baby at home, man at work. But there's so much that comes from that. We didn't create it. The people who are running businesses in society today Today. It's what we grew up with. It's what we were given. But to this day, these things apply. Now, let me tell you a little bit about me so that you understand why I care about this and where I'm coming from. I love business. I always have. My grandfather was an entrepreneur and a small business owner. He owned a tiny little store at the edge of his driveway. It was like a shack. It was literally, it was smaller than this stage. He was the one kosher butcher in his little town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And I remember, if he could get another penny for an item, then I was so excited for him. I thought that was so awesome, because I came to understand that when my mom had been a kid, his ability to get that little bit more change was the difference between having and not having enough money that weekend to eat or a clean dress that weekend. I, I came to understand, I think it was the first family value that I ever understood, the ability to create. And then as I grew up, I create a business. As I grew up, I started thinking about this more and more, and I came to understand that business is the story of innovation. That what we are and what we do, look, why, why do we control the earth? Why are we the species that control the earth? Well, because we create stuff. This is what we do. We, we create things to survive. We create buildings, and we create temperature control buildings, and we create computers, and we create events. So to me, Business and creating your own organization, whatever it is that you're doing in your professional life, speaks to that spark of humanity, innovation. So to me, that's the bare basics of why I care about all this. And I always thought that I was going to go into business, but then I got to college. It turned out that I like to talk a lot, as you can tell. So I became a journalist. Great thing about starting my career on NPR is you can dress like that all the time and no one cares. I started my career in Atlanta and I was uh, covering all sorts of things, also covering big businesses since I was there, Delta, since I am there, Delta, Coca-Cola, but I also started traveling around the world. I reported from Germany where I interviewed Nazis in Nuremberg, I reported from Sydney, Australia, you can see the picture down there. And everywhere I went, I started interviewing families and I would talk to them about, are you able to create an organization here? Are you create, be able to, to, able to create your own charity, create your own business? Because I came to understand that it's like a litmus test for freedom. That if you are in a place in which anyone has a shot, regardless of gender, race, religion, whatever it is, that
then you have more free society. And if you don't have that, then you don't have that. You know, that these things go hand in hand. So I always cared a lot about this as a journalist. And then I jumped from radio over to TV. And here's why. I pitched this role for myself to the head of CNN in which I would be this like uber fact checker guy. And the reason is, I'm sure you've noticed this, it always drove me crazy that on live TV news, lawmakers and politicians and pundits, they can get on the air and literally say anything. And almost never does anyone tell you whether what they said was true or false. So it's like just the missing bare bones basics of what journalism is supposed to be. So it's like the stupidest pitch ever, where I was like, hey, how about if I show up and fact check things? It's like someone showing up in a hospital and say, hey, how about if I start treating patients? Wouldn't that be a good idea? But, but they were still like, okay, give it a shot. So I got my shot on the air. And then um, I started wearing my glasses on the air. And then they started putting me on the air all the time. They were like, put the smart guy on, the guy with the glasses. He knows all this stuff. And now I can't see without them. I did not need my glasses when I started my career. And I think CNN should have to pay for LASIK. It's ridiculous. So, okay, so, so, here's, so here's what happened. So I started doing all this. And because I was fact checking, I came to understand something that very few people do, especially in my field, but in, in journalism and in America in general. I came to understand the difference between real studies and fake studies, real numbers and fake numbers. And I came to understand that all these numbers that you hear in the news, 83% of people like chewing gum while jumping out of an airplane, these, they never, almost ever have an actual basis. And I started to understand things like confidence intervals and random dialing and actual representative sampling. And how do, I came to understand when you can tell a study actually means something. And that is something that I took with me into the other part of my life. So this is my career. The bigger part of who I am as a dad, um, becoming a parent is always dramatic. It's like having a big bang in your life, this, this universe that you're suddenly responsible for. But in my family's case, it's been preposterously dramatic. With our first kid, when he was two days old, um, we found out that he was gonna need major heart surgery. So at seven days, he, he, this is him after surgery. And I like to show this picture because yes, it's horrifying, but this is also beautiful. This is the story of humanity. We adapt to survive, we create stuff. And uh, here he is a year later. I mean, you wouldn't even know what happened. And he's grown up completely healthy, completely normal. I, I had this, well, there is no such thing as normal as Kayla and I discussed. Uh, the doctors like to see his health as being normal. Okay, how's that? So, um, the idea, so I had the same reaction to becoming a dad that most men do. And that is for the first time in my life I suddenly cared about money. And you can tell I didn't care about money because I went to Yale and then went to work for NPR. You don't make any money there at all, <laughs> at all. But all of a sudden I was like, whoa, future and college and right now and mortgage and health insurance. And I started overworking big time. And at the time, the more I got, the more I worked on air on CNN, the more I got paid. So I was doing a lot of seven day weeks, a lot of 16 hour days, working, working, working. And it was really unhealthy. Then came baby number two, and this uh, snapped me out of that craziness. So with baby number two, the drama there was that, I like to put it this way, baby number two, he and my wife conspired to skip labor altogether. While he was in the womb, they just had a conversation, we're not gonna labor. So a few, a few weeks before her due date, my wife fell to the floor of our bedroom, unable to speak, and stuff started coming out into my hands. I won't gross you out. And by the way, if you're gonna have kids someday, I promise none of this will happen to you. None of, like, statistically, I am the exception. This way I can be the magnet for the exception. None of this will happen to you. But she did this incredibly unusual thing in which she didn't labor. And, um, and he started coming out into my hands and wasn't uh, breathing at first. And much later on, um, everything worked out great, but much later on, I felt emotionally ready to share this story. So I did um, on CNN with a friend of mine, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and it has part of the 911 call. Now, I don't always share this, but I feel, I feel you all here. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share this a couple minutes uh, with you, and you'll hear this little bit of uh, my 911 call that day. We're back with SGMD. You know, every week on this program, we're going to be taking you into the lives of some pretty fascinating people. They could be scientists, medical innovators, celebrities. Today we're talking to someone who's all three, quite literally. <laughs> My colleague Josh Lebs uh, had the experience of a lifetime. So th thanks for joining us, first of all. You got it. It's amazing. You, you, you delivered your, your own baby. Yeah. Uh, this, this happened at home. Right. The, the first question I think in a lot of people's minds is, 
why or, yeah. or what exactly happened? How, how, how did it all occur? It's not planned, and I would not <laughs> recommend. I wouldn't recommend planning it. I mean, what happened in our case was that basically my wife skipped labor. She didn't spend any time laboring. She knows what it is to labor. We have an older child. This is our second child. Right? This is our second child with, the, with our older child. There was 24 hours of labor, which is standard. Uh, with this one, all of a sudden, she felt something bent over by the bed, was feeling something even more powerful, got down on the floor, boom, within a couple of minutes. So no contractions her. beforehand? Because she knows what it feels like. She, she knows all the steps very well, and she knows what the feelings would be. This is incredibly unusual, but it happened to her. So she's down on the floor and says, call an ambulance. I get on the phone with 911. Here's a little clip of what happened. What do I do? Okay. I'm holding my baby's head. Okay, listen, I want you to support the shoulders okay. and hold the hips and legs firmly. Okay. And remember, the baby will be slippery, so don't drop it, okay? Okay. Okay, so is the baby completely out of just a head? No, just a head. I'm seeing okay. a head. It's scrunched up. Let me, let him. But it's not crying. It's not making noise. Its eyes are shut. Okay. Have her to push hard and get the baby out, okay? No, push hard. Get the baby out. Push hard. Push hard. Oh, my God. I'm holding my baby. Right. There's a built cord and there's someone wrapped around his neck. I'm taking okay. it off. Okay, listen. Gen <sighs> gently watch the baby's mouth and nose. Oh, okay. It's choking. It's choking on okay, the cord. Uh, breathe, baby. Breathe. Breathe, baby, breathe. I'm going to leave it let me, off. Let me, hear, let me give you a CPR instructions for the baby, okay? Oh, the baby's breathing. Is the baby breathing? Yes, it's breathing. Woo! It breathed. Everything worked out great. Everything worked out just fine. Ah. <sighs> That full thing is not where I want it to be online, which is why you sometimes on my computer see how the sausage is made. I like this. Um, so, so he, like, it took a while for me to get used to it. I mean, at first, for the, in the months afterwards, every time I blinked, I could see that image of his face on the inside of my eyelids. Not breathing at first, the umbilical cord all over the neck. Um, but after a while, I came to process it, and I actually became really grateful that that had happened. Um, and by the way, let me take a moment to say that to every woman who has ever given birth, I'm just so completely in awe and grateful on behalf of all of humanity for everything that it, it's literally like the word heroic is overused in life. And then you see that and you're like, what? I will literally never, ever. So anyway. <laughs> so. The effect that this had on me, though, ended up being profound because I realized that in that moment, I didn't care about money. Well, I cared about life. I cared about moments. I cared about connection and family. All the other stuff went away. And I realized that I was living wrong because I had been coming home every day. It was really important to me to be very involved in, in my older son's life, even though I was overworking. I was doing those 16-hour those days starting at like 4 in the morning. And then I would come home, and I would make dinner. I would do his bath. I took him on walks. I did all the books. I, I, so I was doing all this, but I wasn't really mentally present. You know, a lot of the time, my wife would be like, you hoo where are you? Um, and I realized that I didn't want to miss the moment. So I started looking for work-life balance. And at this point, I started talking about fatherhood on the air and doing segments with dads on the air. I interviewed a bunch of dads. And the first time I did this, the responses that we got were, were crazy big. I, uh, we aired three different segments. Um, well, the first time I sat down with a group of dads, and we had totally normal conversations. We talked about uh, the things that men actually in real life talk about. We talked about our stresses and our hopes and our dreams and what kind of dads do we want to be and how do we compare to the generation before us. And, and if we are having to work and totally responsible for the financial stuff, what's that stress like? Um, if we're stay-at-home dads, what is that like? If our partner is working also, how do we balance it? All of these completely normal things. I aired them. Um, I figured they would be solid segments. I didn't think they would be like particularly special. But the responses that we got to this were crazy. This became the number one thing on the CNN Newsroom blog. We're getting all these calls and emails and responses. I got calls from media wanting to interview me about being a dad in the media who interviews other dads. Because, and I was like, so I was trying to understand what was going on. Why did people care this much? And this is when I came to understand that no one had ever seen that done on television or really in any kind of public space. People only saw stereotypes. They didn't even know that men have actually completely normal conversations. They did, this hadn't happened before. So I decided, OK, I'm going to turn this into something. So in addition to covering all the news, I also started covering fatherhood. And then, remember I said I'm the one who knows how to do these fact checking? So then I started looking at all the studies about fatherhood and about parenthood. And just some of the facts that I found, the true 
honest to goodness facts about what's going on with fathers in America. Uh, working fathers, the average working father spends three hours each workday caring for his children. Virtually all fathers who live with their kids care for them in every major category at least several days a week, if not every day. And those categories are clothing, bathing, feeding, uh, talking with them about their day, doing their homework with them. All of these things, oh, and that second point on the screen here, okay, to totally blast conceptions, the, by far the vast majority of black fathers in America live with their children and are statistically the most involved. There are all these very popular lies out there. And I started looking at these numbers. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, let's, let's get rid of that. Yeah, and what it really boils down to when you look at these numbers is that men who live with our kids are virtually all of us are very hands-on. But no one knows this because it violates the stereotype. And dads are suffering uh, from work-life conflict as well. So I started covering all this. And here I become like this dad who's covering dadhood. But then came this giant switcheroo with baby number three, when suddenly I became the dad in the news, and here is what happened there. My wife and I were thinking, okay, this time we're gonna have the drama-free baby. Everything's gonna go smooth, third time's the charm. Instead, um, my new baby and I end up on the, the front page of the New York Times business section. So here's, uh, because it's my family, we just, you know, the magnets for the, so here's what happened there. Um, while my wife was pregnant, uh, we realized that for a combination of reasons, I would be needed at home to do caregiving after the baby was born. Now. That is, as I had been reporting on CNN, completely normal. It happens. Dads do caregiving now. Unfortunately, all over the country, we still have these madmen structures in place. The policy that I was under at CNN made absolutely no sense. It was constructed so that the effect was that any parent could get 10 paid weeks to care for their new kid, except a guy who got his own wife pregnant. <laughs> yep. So, if I put my daughter up for adoption, anyone else, including a guy, could adopt her at my workplace and get 10 paid weeks to care for her. All right, how about this one? If I had a same-sex domestic partner and he adopted a baby, okay, but I did not co-adopt the baby, I could still get 10 paid weeks to care for his baby. But I, the real me, I couldn't get this 10 paid weeks. So I, I found out the protocol, and I went in secret to, directly to benefits, and I said, look, this has got to be an oversight. When you were adding all these groups of people who could get 10 paid weeks for caregiving, there's no way you meant to exclude the possibility that a dad who has this baby the old-fashioned way <laughs> might need to care for said baby. Um, and they were like, oh, that's an interesting idea, huh? And then... <laughs> And then months went by with no answer. And then, because it's my family, here's what happens next. My wife goes in for her 35-week appointment, and her symptoms from preeclampsia are so serious and so scary that they have to induce right then. So I had already asked the, the company months ago, no answer. Now I'm messaging them from the hospital room. I need an, an answer now. Still no answer. Uh, 11 days later, I'm home holding my four-pound preemie and caring for my sick wife and my two boys. And I write work saying, I have to know, am I going back to work now? Because a person like me could only get two weeks. Um, or am I going to get it? And uh, that's when they wrote me back saying, no, you can't have it. Now, the rest of the story is in my book, which I'll, I'll talk to you about. But um, what I want you to know for now is that I announced on um, social media that I was taking legal action against this policy. I talked with attorneys, and, I, and they were like all gung-ho about this. And when I made that announcement, it felt like I had unleashed the floodgates of love. I started getting all this support from people across every spectrum across the country and around the world. Women's groups and men's groups, conservatives and liberal leaders, uh, people across the economic spectrum, the, the racial spectrum. All this support coming in and all this media coming in. I'm getting a call, oh, now they're talking about you on the Today Show, and by that point, like, it just kept happening. Oh, by the way, I don't like this picture on the New York Times, um, but take a look. They also did a drawing in the New York Times store, which is hilarious. It's just so, that's their drawing of me. It's so funny. Although later on, like when they did an update on my case, it's so funny. Later on when they did an update on my case, they actually had like a cuter picture, which I'll show you later, and of my, my kid, not of me. Anyway, so, so, so here's what happened. So uh, all this support came in. And so as a journalist, I became fascinated. What is it about my family's little case that makes all these people so interested. It was like that whole same thing again as when I first reported on dads. I figured there would be some interest. Okay, guy takes legal action. But this was crazy, and it was huge. It was, I mean, Maria Shriver's group and Cheryl Zandberg's group. It was all over. And, and that's when I started digging into this as a journalist to figure out what was it about my case that was inspiring, especially so many women's groups. And that's when I came to understand this, that we... 
we still have this network in this country of three things, laws, policies, and stigmas that are keeping us in this madman era. They're acting as gender police. This is happening in the workplace to this day. So the conversation that, that was up here just before me was really interesting because it is true that there is a glass ceiling. I mean, that does exist. And there are also all these factors to it. And I realized that this part of it was what no one was ever talking about, this whole idea that if men can't be caregivers, there's absolutely no way that women can have an equal shot in the workplace. It's not going to happen. So I started digging into these laws and policies and, and stigmas to try to understand what this is all about, how it came to be. And that is what led to, uh, to my book, All In. And uh, HarperCollins came up with the subtitle. It's lots of words in the subtitle. How our work first culture fails dads, families, and businesses, and how we can fix it together. I never actually say it. I just say it's called All In. Um, but but here's, here's what I came to understand. For the first time, everything started to make sense to me. I mentioned earlier, we are the only nation on Earth that doesn't make, make sure that when a baby is born, it can have a parent at home and food on the table for at least a block of weeks. Um, only developed nation. It's literally, it's only us and, and Suriname and Papua New Guinea. So what you see on this map here is that the countries, and I'm being generous by countries, in red, in dark red, are the ones that have no paid maternity leave structure. And um, you can see, it's just the United States, right? Um, but no one had ever explained why. All of a sudden, I understand why. Of course we have no paid maternity leave in America. Because the whole thinking is, she's a woman. Who needs her money? There's a man. He's supposed to make the money. Boom, it all makes sense. Now, this is the maternity leave map. What we never really see is the paternity leave map. Um, the darker, the more paternity leave is available uh, as, a, as a society, and I'll explain how this works. Um, and what's really, and we have, of course, we're totally light in the US because there's none here. But what's, what's really striking to me as I dug into this is that this map is basically irrelevant because all over the world, when paternity leave is available, the overwhelming majority of it goes unused. Most of it is unused by far. And the reason is stigmas. They are by far the most powerful part of all of this. This is a line from my book, and it's true, that men to this day face derision, demotions, even loss of their jobs if they dare to take time off to care for their children or they dare to seek a flexible schedule. And so there are lots of stories in my book. One of them is a man who was told by his boss that he could not have the time that he's legally entitled to because women are supposed to take care of babies unless they're in a coma or dead. There's another guy in my book who got a call in the workplace. Um, the, his wife uh, was 38, at 38 weeks. The placenta stopped working. The baby wasn't moving. Again, it won't happen to you. Um, he, he, so he was crying. He like, ran out, of course. All he did, the, the birth went great. Everything worked out great. He just missed the rest of that week. He missed a couple days. That's it. He came back Monday. And his boss called him in and rebuked him. How dare you take off so much time? Don't you know you're needed around here? And that boss was a pregnant woman. So, yeah, which is the same sound that I made when I first heard that. But the lawyers who are out there working for better systems, better equality, uh, are women. And they didn't even blink when I told them that. Because they said, unfortunately, it really is so tough for a lot of women to work their way up for, in, in the workplace to these higher positions. Often the ones who do have had to kind of take on some of that mentality about the roles of men and women. So anyway, so the, my book is filled with these stories. And I came to understand what a crucial piece of the puzzle, this whole thing is, that as long as men have all these pressures against us being able to be caregivers, we're not going to have the chance to uh, help women advance in the workplace. Women get left without choices. If the guy can't stay home, then the woman ends up staying home. And families don't have their own opportunity to make choices. I'll, uh, you guys hear a lot of businesses have their own offerings, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that. I don't believe that businesses should be required to offer this stuff at all. That's not the solution. Um, more than half of companies, 58% of companies, have some paid maternity leave. Only 14% have uh, paternity leave. And we keep hearing reports about more and more businesses that are, are making moves this way. Um, and that's good, but the real solutions are much bigger than that, and they're the big picture, and they're really good news. I get to, I, these days, I get to go around preaching awesome news, because I can present what the problem is, how we are all in this together. That's why my book is called All In, because we are literally, we are all affected by the same set of structures that are taking options away from families. But I am obsessed with solutions. I love fixing things which I know is sometimes a problem because you don't want men to fix things. You want men to listen a lot of the time and not try to fix everything. I know, I know. Um, we were talking about that great YouTube video with the nail in the head, have any of you seen it? Where the one was like, just listen to me. And he's like, but you have a nail in your forehead. I want to pull it out. Okay, but she's like, no. So, 
you know, but, but I happen to be a person, maybe because of my gender, who really cares a lot about solutions. But the good news is that these solutions work across the board for absolutely everybody. And ultimately, they do the most important thing. They allow families to have the kind of work-life integration that we need. Uh, the good news is, and I'm going to get a little bit wonky for just a couple minutes, but then I'm going to get back to all the personal stuff. Because that's really, to me, more what Ignite is all about. But part of what I'm so passionate about is telling people the facts. And I get to do that now. And I work with businesses, and I work with governments. Um, this is really cool. So public paid family leave programs are the solution to all this. And they already exist in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. And they don't require businesses to pay anything. So when you need paid family leave, and this is, if you look at the picture I'm using there, it's also for caring for elderly parents, which more and more of us are doing. Pay, public paid family leave programs act, act as an insurance system. You put a tiny little bit of money out of your paycheck into it, and when you need paid family leave for any reason, to care for a child, to care for a sick spouse, to care for yourself after an illness, to care for an elderly parent, any of these things, you get paid out of that fund. The business does not have to pay you. The business can stop paying you. It can save that money. It can use the money how it wants. And anyway, it, what, what it ultimately does is it allows people to take time off and then come back. I'm just going to bang through these because I want you to know that when I go to businesses, I show these numbers. It's proven to be incredible. It's lifting profits. It's keeping people in the workplace. It's expanding the tax base. This is what's happening in California. Big numbers. This is what's happening in New Jersey. 12 out of the 18 businesses surveyed said it's helping them. So all that is awesome. It's also saving businesses a lot of money because right now a lot of people are dropping out of the workforce. And they don't have to drop out of the workforce if they get paid family leave. They choose not to. So they save all that money. And I work with small businesses as well. This is one in Massachusetts. They only have 18 employees. And they're letting them get three months paid leave. And I asked them, why are they doing that? And they showed me the numbers. They said when they do that, it keeps attracting and retaining the best possible employees. It's a lot cheaper than replacing them. So anyway, that's, that's the number stuff. But the, the number one thing that I tell people with organizations of any size, businesses, whatever it is that you do, is that this is about communication. So many people, we heard before that some businesses are afraid to have conversations about groping, sexual assault. People are afraid to talk about stuff. So many women I've talked to have told me that they just wish that their bosses had been willing to have a conversation. I'm like, hey, we know you're, you're having this baby. What can we do to make this work for you? We don't have all this money. We can't pay you while you're off, but you know, can, we, can we work something out? Is there something that you'll need when you come back? Can we help ease your transition back? Just having that conversation and not being afraid to talk about this is really important. And it's the same thing's got to happen with men. I now travel around, and I, a lot of the places that I speak at, men end up sharing their stories for the first time ever about how they've been struggling, about how their kids have struggles, about how their kids have problems, about how they have not been able to figure out how to do it all. It all. As though that's ever achievable. And a lot of the time, what happens is after those men speak out, women say, wow, I've never heard that before. I didn't know that this is something we're all dealing with. So when we come to understand that we are all dealing with this together, we do better. We work on it together. Right now, a lot of women, most women say that the reason that they dropped out of the workforce was that their husbands didn't have a chance to stay home. So a lot of women are having to stop their careers. And meanwhile, a lot of men, in this country, men are even more likely than women to switch jobs or careers move to another state, even move to another country to have more time with their families. Guys are doing it, but the difference is we're not talking about it. We're not telling anybody that this is what we're doing. So nobody knows we're suffering in the shadows. And that sucks because we need to be speaking out about this in order to do anything with it. And this is global. It's happening all over the world. Dads really want more time with their children. And that brings me to this video. Oh, uh, this is one more thing, a stigmas. These same stigmas that say it's bad to be a caregiver, for men to be a caregiver, they show up in different ways all over the world, but it's the same stigma. So and there's, there are certain societies in which the women worry that the men will be seen as enslaved or bewitched by their wives if it gets out that the guys were caught horrors changing diapers or you know, doing any. So it's this same stigma that's going on all over the world. And it's something that we need to, uh, we need to tackle together. And lots of men are tackling together, which brings me to my next video. I'll show you a couple minutes of this. This is really cool. Take a look. Being a father means being there for them through thick and thin. Oh, being a father means being supportive, being a role model. I am a provider. I'm a protector. An educator, a navigator, a soother, a listener. Being a dad is quite tough, actually. It's my grandpa, my papa, and my dad. He loves me. And then take care of me.
Jadi sebetulnya ketika istri saya sedang mengandung itu adalah proses so um, there's, there's more to it, and I'll share it with you all afterwards. I'll tweet it out so you can all see uh, where, it, uh, where it goes and where it belongs. But the other piece in this is that we are really being held back by this myth that is still so prevalent, this false idea that dads are lazy at home. This is so, here's what I'm going to tell you. This myth about the lazy dad is prejudice against women. And this is the complex thing that I learned when I was digging into my book. This is so unhealthy. So I'm going to tell you two things. One, that it's false, but two, that it's so bad for women because men, there are a lot of leaders out there who believe this. They believe that if you give a dad a flexible schedule or you let him stay home to do caregiving, what he's really going to do is kick up his feet and watch a game. So if you want the man to be productive, make sure he stays in the office. Let the woman go home. She does all the real work there anyway. So let's make sure we're honoring women by making sure they have the time to go stay home and we're making sure the men actually get stuff done by keeping them at work. And what you're actually doing is taking away choices from families and in some cases in which you have a, a, a mom who's sick you know <laughs> you're taking away parents at all from families so these backward ways of thinking are actually very dangerous and uh, it's my industry's fault sometimes the news industry does uh, you guys know this I mean it's not a surprise and I know we have a newspaper editor in here and other fellow journalists I'm proud to be one but sometimes our industry by and large does such a bad job we have moments in which we suck this so this is a perfect example, okay? So there's this place called Pew Research. You've probably heard of it. They are now my nemesis. Pew Research, in, in the news business, if Pew Research says something, you just take it as gospel. Like, oh, it's got to be fact now. So Pew Research did this report, another gender gap. Men spend more time in leisure activities. And then look at all the headlines I put under it that came, or the, the, new, the, the lines from stories that followed. The gender leisure gap, why women are losing their time to just chill out. Report, men have more time for fun than women do. And the worst of all is the bottom right. The moral of the story, whether it's the weekday or the weekend, dads need to spend less time on the golf course or watching TV and more time helping their wives take out the trash and play with the kids. Now, when a lot of us hear that, we would be like, oh, good message. That's exactly what our society needs. Now, let me tell you, remember I said that stuff about fact-checking real studies? Here's what Pew Research actually found. There's this thing called the American Time Use Survey in which people write down how they spend their day. On average, Dads listed about 20 minutes more as being for leisure or sports. But what Pew did not mention, on average, moms listed about 20 minutes more as being for sleep. Those two things literally con con counteract each other. And what we actually know, so this literally means that like, if a mom goes upstairs to her bedroom 20 minutes earlier and the dad is outside like, playing catch for those 20 minutes, then they both end up like, you know, getting the same amount of sleep. It, 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 it's literally um, a sign of equality <laughs> that like, they're just choosing how to use those 20 minutes differently. We've achieved a level of egalitarianism at home that no one realizes because of these false reports. This is how I feel every time I see one of these reports, and they pop up all the time. It's, and, and so I start like contacting news agencies saying, this is so bad, you've got to stop this backward stereotype. But uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get through to them. And this is the line from my book. Moms and dads actually work equally hard on behalf of their families. When you combine paid work with household chores and care, we're putting in the same amount of time. Dads and moms are putting in the same amount of time. And it's important that leaders everywhere understand that. You can trust a man to have time for caregiving. The same way you can trust a woman to succeed in the workplace. And this is what I've come to understand about Neanderthals who have backward mindsets. People who believe that women don't belong in the workplace also believe that men don't belong at home. People who believe that women are less capable, less good at being leaders in the workplace, also believe that men are less capable of leading things at home. Those are literally, anti-dad prejudices are literally the flip side of the exact same coin. And they're a big part of what's holding women back in the workplace. So, look, I am typical. This is me with my two younger kids. A lot of people hear me, see me, and think, well, okay, maybe you're the exception. Maybe you're just like putting a, a rosy picture on it. I'm not. Statistically, with how committed I am to my family, the fact that they're more important to me than money, more important to me than everything, the fact that I make sure to spend so much time at home with, with my family, the fact that I change the diapers and care for my kids, I'm literally the American norm. So a lot of what I do when I get to travel around now is say that and share that. Um, but there's another thing I want to share with you all now, which is the more personal. Here at, at Women Ignite, one of the things that I love about this is that we get to talk about our inspirations, like what, what leads us. And there are a lot of people who ask me like, why I, I did what I did, instead of just like, accepting that was the policy and just moving on, why I decided to fight. My whole career 
is weird this way. I've always created my own job. I've never applied for a job and been hired. Like, I don't think I've ever applied for a job, ever. I created my own job on NPR, and then I created my own job on CNN when I went and had that meeting. And I, at one point, I had a, a, an agency I created where I was helping men have the world's most amazing marriage proposals and then capturing them on video. I created that. This is just what I do. I, I'm weird this way. I like to just like, feel my instincts and figure out what I'm supposed to do. And I, I follow my instincts. But a big reason that I have found that I can make it work is that I have learned to maximize opportunities. And what we all have is a chance to maximize the opportunities. And sometimes the opportunities are ones you would not ask for. It sucked that I could not be home to care for my wife and my kid, my baby, and, and my two older boys. I had to go back to work. Had to make the money, didn't have a choice. It was awful time. And we went into debt because we had to hire someone, didn't have the money for that, I mean, all this stuff. Um, but I ended up saying, okay, what can I do about this? So I turned it into an opportunity. And ultimately, Time Warner not only revolutionized their entire policy, making it better for men and women, but they'll tell you the exact same thing I'll tell you, that it's better for everybody, that it's, that it's a good thing. And I ended up doing the book, and I get to talk about these things. So I, I took what sucked. I took a very difficult time, but I turned it into the best opportunity that I could. And what I've always done throughout my entire career is do that. So I have this expression um, that I've come up with, and it's, it's a mantra that I live by, and it's called Be the Cups and Ice. And it's based on this, I'm gonna date myself here, but it's based on uh, a scene from the sitcom Friends, which like even the young people here have at least heard of it. Um, and, and so, and I used it in my TEDx talk, I'm gonna show it to you here. So here, here's the setup, so in case you don't know, there were three major female characters on the show. And what happened there <laughs> was that it was going to be, it was Rachel's birthday. And Monica was this total control freak. So Monica was organizing the whole party. But Phoebe, in her instincts, in her dreams, she really wanted to be a part of the party. She wanted to help do the party. So finally, Monica relented and told her, okay, you can be in charge of, of the cups and ice. And like, to anybody else, that would sound like it's absolutely nothing. Like, who cares about just doing the cups and ice, right? But Phoebe uh, was brilliant. I love that character. And uh, here, I'm gonna skip ahead to it right here. And this is, this is uh, what, what she did. Uh, cup hat, cup banner, cup chandelier, and the thing that started it all, the cup. <laughs> Great job with the cup, Steve. <laughs> Why don't you just go out with her? <laughs> and did you notice the ice? Look, we have it all. We have crushed, cubed, and dry. Watch. Oh. <laughs> Mystical. Oh. <laughs> No one's eating my Tuscan finger food because they're all filling up on Phoebe's snow cones. There are snow cones? <laughs> snow cones? <laughs> comments about what I've done. But, hey, you guys uh, like that. The one yeah, no, it's awesome. So um, I love that expression. And so be the cups and ice. So he, here's how I've always used that in my career. When I first wanted to start on public radio, um, I showed up at the local public radio station during one of those annoying pledge drives. And I was like, I'll do whatever. I'll take out the trash. I don't care. And I started inter, uh, like, interning there like just a few weeks later by talking them into it. Then eventually, um, I learned how to do it well, learned how to do the on-air stuff. And then after a few months, uh, the program director said, listen, why don't you try doing a story? So I worked really hard, and I did the story, and they actually aired it. And then she said to me, you know what? She was like shocked that I didn't suck. She was like, oh, well, you know what? Feel free to do more. So she figured I would probably do like one a month. But when she said, feel free to do more, I was like, whoa, that's a big opportunity. So I started doing six reports a day. I, <laughs> I was working like at night and morning. I was never sleeping. There was a little 24-hour place that sold burritos next door to the public radio station. That was all I ate for like months because I just kept doing that. And so all of a sudden, I went from having never spoken into a microphone ever to being all over the air. And then two months later, the network um, said to me, hey, you want to try something with us? And I was like, sure. And then once they said, feel free to do more, I only did network stuff. So then I was reporting for the network continuously. And all of a sudden, I had this job for myself. So that's how I did that. And then later on, when I wanted to create the thing on CNN, it took a while to convince them. And finally, when I convinced the guy 
to uh, let me give a, to, to give me a shot. It was the, the president of the company. He had said no, so I had poured my efforts back into NPR and won some awards, mostly just to impress CNN. And then he he gave, yeah, and then he because he he said something in a morning meeting once. He's like, um, how come Josh Lev just won those Murrow Awards for NPR and not for us? So I called him and I was like, why do you think you haven't put me on the air yet? So then we had a meeting, and the meeting lasted four minutes. And I said I want to do this thing called reality check. I explained it, and then uh, he said, okay, you know what? Try it on the weekend. Now, anybody else would hear that and like try a report on the weekend and then hope that people liked that and allow them to continue. But I, I started thinking, okay, how can I cups and ice this? And then I realized when he said try it on the weekend, he didn't say try one, he said try it. So I realized that the weekend is 48 hours long. It's from midnight Friday night until midnight Sunday night. But then I also realized that we had an international channel, CNNI, and on fr Thursday, Friday, yes, it's already a weekend somewhere in the world, and on Monday, it's still weekend somewhere in the world. So I started doing all these segments fr from Friday through Monday. I did more segments in one day than any reporter on all of CNN did an entire week. And I did all these different topics, and then it was the same thing. I made myself this juggernaut. It was like, where did he come from? But I was basically like turning CNN into a cups and ice party. It was like, what can Josh do about this? So then that turned into an opportunity for me. So I, so I grabbed that opportunity. I took it. Um, and there's one more thing that I, I do. We're going to be talking in this next session about. Oh, and by the way, start texting in your questions because I want I want to talk to you about anything you want to hear. Anything. You'll be shocked. It's it's, it's tough to to make me to find a topic that I don't want to talk about. I'm not sure they exist. Anyway, um, I. I know we're going to be talking about like our different life experiences and how our perspectives shape this. So I mentioned earlier that my grandfather was a, a kosher butcher. Uh, I actually keep kosher. I, I'm Jewish and I keep kosher. And um, that is intimately connected to the reason that I live my career the way I do, the reason that I'm, I'm working for better systems for everyone, the reason that I care about social justice. And I, I talked to a little bit about this last night at dinner, that every time I eat, because I have these restrictions, I, a part of my mind is reminded of generations of, in my case, Jewish people, who went through preposterous struggles that like, no human being should ever have to struggle through. Uh, and all, everything they did, everything they sacrificed, all their hard work, it all paved the way to today, when I can be here right now, doing, living my life how I want to, and having my faith all at the same time and not being worried that I'm gonna be killed for it, it's, it's so huge. It's a level of freedom that is, I think if I went back in time, I don't think they, most people could imagine the kind of freedom that I can have now in, in this era that my generation can. So I believe that when you have that, there's a responsibility that comes along with it. And that responsibility is to honor the generations that worked so hard to get where you are to get you to where you are. You would be, to me, it would be hypocritical to just take the freedom and go live my life and like hakuna matata, like who cares, go do whatever. I have to honor all of them, what they didn't get to live to do, what they didn't get to do. Uh, I have to work as hard as I can, but I also have to love life. I have to love every minute of it. And I have to uh, fill my life with love. Uh, you can tell, I got a lot of love in me. No shame in that, right? Kayla, the shame slayer, right? There's no, no shame in that. Uh, it's, it, it, I, I need to do that because I owe it to all of them. And it's not just religion. It's the exact same thing when I think about the people who settled this country. And like literally, what they just physically had to change about the land to make it possible to live. The, the kinds of technologies that got us to the point in which my kid is alive, whereas like 200 years ago, what, a third of kids just died anyway. I mean, it, we, we, I feel so much responsibility to so many generations of people who got us to where we are now that I have to keep working because I have to do it for all of them. So the more that I think about this, the more I'm committed to having to cups and ice every opportunity that ever comes my way. I have to make sure. So if life hands me lemons like it did, there was a horrible situation when my wife was so sick, I have to turn that into the best thing I possibly can. So for me, that is a part of, of what fuels me and that's a part of what ignites me. And that, that leads me to how I wanna end this and then go to your questions. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, that uh, I have this view of humanity, but I, I wanna ask you all this. Uh, what was your first dream? Not your first overnight dream, your first aspirational dream, when you imagined what you wanted to do, to have, to feel. 
Now, when I, when I say what was your first dream, most people's first reaction is, oh, I wanted to be uh, a, a movie star. I wanted to be a cowboy, a ballerina, an astronaut, horseback rider. Um, but, but we're wrong. The first dream that we all had was the same one. It was to be held and, and loved and to explore this amazing world, whatever it is, with love in our lives. You can look into the eyes of any baby and you see that that is literally the first dream. We don't even think about it because it is, it is the definition of primal. It's the first thing that we felt, that dream. So what I'm all about is putting these two halves together. I mentioned earlier that to me, innovation is the story of humanity, but I kind of lied. Innovation is only part of the story of humanity. Half, probably less than half, because I think the other part is even bigger. The other half of the story of us is that we love. This is what we are and this is what we do. So when I talk about the things I talk about now and I fight for what I'm fighting for, structures and systems in which everyone gets to honor their time with the people they love. You don't have, it doesn't have to be for children. It can be doing the things you love, the love from your friends, having that in your life, putting those two things together. When people use the expression, I'm living the dream, to me, you gotta be doing both to be living the dream. And ultimately, that simple math is what it is to be all in. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are so sweet. Aw, thank you. We're gonna keep talking, though. I knew I'd feel so good here. You know, I told Shelly, like, we were on LinkedIn, and I was like, you're having that conference? You are going to bring me out there. And, uh, and she made it happen. Um, this is all my contact information. Absolutely everybody link in with me. Link in with me. They say only link in with people you know. I don't know why they say that. I link in with everyone at my event. And it's so helpful because then I can find you afterwards. Like, LinkedIn is the only good place that shows me that you're here and that this is how we met. Um, now, time to dig into your questions. Question number one, does the public paid family leave policy allow for mental health time off to care for loved one? That's a great question. Okay, so um, this gets back to what we need in this country. We need a national system of public paid family leave. And just so you all know, like that is not a partisan thing at all. That's the, the overwhelming majority of Republicans, Democrats, and independents all want a, a paid family leave insurance program. Uh, I was at this rally in Washington in which um, there were a lot of liberal people speaking and they had me speak. And then these two guys came up to me and they, they said um, they were from LifeSite News. One of them left the Republican Party because it was too liberal for him. And the other one said he's from the far right of the Republican Party. And they said, we just want to shake your hand. We are totally on board with this. Because th this is really, this is about family. So public paid family leave, since it's proven to be good for business, the question here, does it allow uh, a mental health time off to care for a loved one? And uh, the answer is yes. As the way that it's written, as long as you have a legitimate uh, reason under what's existing right now, FMLA, to, to have time off, um, to care for a person. This ensures that there is pay for it. Now, each state gets to write its own regulations right now. It would be better if we had one big national one. It, would, it expands the economy, it keeps people more working. You know, we hear a lot about the national debt, and when we hear about the debt, it's always in the context of let's spend less. But that's only half of what you have to do. You spend less, but also let's make more money. That's the other way to pay off debt. And when you have paid family leave, it's proven. You expand the number of people who are working, you expand corporate productivity. So. Um, Yes, the way that, it, that it's written, uh, mental health um, is covered uh, in the places that exist now. What are the top three things we can start doing today to help heal the gender inequality for men and women, uh, moms and dads? Awesome. So the number one thing is to communicate in a new way in your workplace. It's really important to understand men are raised not to talk about this stuff. We are raised don't talk about gender because no matter what you say, if you say, no matter what you say, someone's gonna say to you, oh, you privileged man, what do you know? Just like this group that you know, told Shelly I shouldn't be here today. Um, you know, that, that's really, it's, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. So men are raised not to talk about this. In fact, if you think about the stereotype in the workplace, the stereotype is that when there's a meeting, men do more of the talking because women don't lean in, right? Well, 
I travel to, to businesses. I talk to so many of them. When I talk about this, the women are all over me raising their hands saying stuff, and the guys are usually like much more quiet. It's the reverse of that because men are raised not to talk about this stuff. So the number one thing to do is to create a culture in which people feel comfortable talking about this so it's literally striking up conversations in the workplace. Like, you know, I'm struggling or because I have to figure out how to go do this doctor appointment. Uh, I know you have kids. How do you deal with that? and make them feel totally comfortable doing that. I actually organize, at businesses, I organize events of just men so that we can have a conversation the first time without any women there so they can feel safe doing it. And then I have step number two, which is I come back, and that time just a couple women there as observers. And at the end of that meeting, the observers always say they were blown away and loved it. So then the guys realize they can actually do it. And then we work toward actual cultural change. Uh, so that's one. And, and number two is uh, getting the right policies in place. Um, it actually is very bad business to have these uh, systems that push women to only have the chance to stay home. And um, number three, uh, which is really number one, is to get them a copy of my book because I lay out very specifically, here's step one through, oh, I should tell you all this. So HarperCollins, when they had me do the book, they said, we, we want you to, this is your polemic, this is your lean in. And Sheryl Sandberg is in my book, I, she sat down with me, she had contacted me and she says things that aren't in lean in, in my book. But, but they said to me, we want you to literally tell us what are the steps forward to make this work. And then I turned in the draft and they liked it a lot. They said, the thing is missing is that the end of chapters literally give us steps one through 10, like actually write it out in number form. So I did that. So I actually have a, a list of, of steps to be taken. Uh, what is the biggest surprise you've had since you started advocating for dads? That's a great question. Um, I was surprised at the speed with which um, this, my message was accepted and took off um, all over the country and, and around the world. I knew that there would be groups that were ready to hear it and ready and willing to hear it and excited. Um, but I also figured that there would be more people like that group that contacted Shelley saying, wait a second, this is about women. We don't need to hear from a man. Um, and and I, I always say, look, I have this line that I say now, and I tell people this in sessions. I say, everyone has an exactly equal right to care about equality. It's just a fact. I tell them, I say, don't apologize for being a white man. <laughs> you know, it, you have the same right to care about equality as another person does. So I thought that the resistance would be a little bigger than it was, and it's not, and that's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Um, are we pausing there? Okay, so let me also just take this moment. If you guys have more questions, go for it. But I, I wanna tell you something about the books because Shelley did something really special um, for you all. There's a system, and I don't control this, and none of it's gonna affect my pockets, literally. I, I won't get a penny either way. But here, here's how it works. Shelley, um, purchased, the, this event purchased uh, the books in bulk at a big, big discount. If you buy them at the regular rate, it's a lot more money. She bought them a discount. So now this event owns these books. So if you buy it today, you are getting um, it cheaper than anywhere else. I'll sign it to anyone you want. And literally 100% of the money that you are paying goes to this conference. It goes to support the conference, which is phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. And it's a bit of a risk. It's always a bit of a risk because those, when you get it at that rate, um, the way that bookstores work, if you get it at that rate, you can't return them and you can't go sell them on, on Amazon. So hopefully you will all choose to, uh, to do it. That, that's my goal. And like I said, it doesn't affect me, but I want everyone in the world to read it. So it affects me that way. Um, so when your family doesn't support your career choices, how do you push through that when you know you are living your purpose? Okay, so number one um, thing I can tell you about this is that one thing that I keep learning over and over is that when you are a parent, you teach far more through example than you do through conversation. So it's great to be able to say to your children um, and you know, your spouse, hey, this is what I need to do, support me and help them understand it. But if they don't, you just have to keep doing it. And I am fortunate in that my wife knew she was marrying a guy who was like, Cops and I, it's like, I'm gonna live a different life. Like, you'll never know what I'm up to next. In fact, the way we met was that she interviewed me for a story. She was sent to interview me. And at the time, she asked me like, what I wanted my long-term career to be. And I said, actually, I wanna have a project lifestyle my entire life. I don't ever wanna be Josh Lev's the blank. I always wanted to be, well, what's he up to now? Oh, that's interesting. You know, that, like that, that to me is the, the most sensible way to live, keep following those instincts. So I'm fortunate that I have that kind of general support. Um, but when you don't, you know, you work to try to get it, but ultimately you do what you do, you cups and ice your opportunities anyway, whether the support's there or not, and your kids are gonna see so much. They're gonna see that you tried, 
They're going to see that you didn't give up. And in some way, at some point, you will succeed. I have this, this line that I also say in my TEDx. I say, uh, success is not a point. It's a line. There's infinite places to hit success. So this is why it always bothers me a little bit if someone says that their dream is to like perform on Broadway. Because that's a point. I'm like, can your dream be to perform before really big crowds in theater? Like, what's so bad about London's West End or like some big theater in LA or some big theater in Boise? And, and, and I, think of, um, I think of David Letterman. I think, and I know that like my references seem so weird, but see how they always end up making sense, like if you follow my mind? So think of David Letterman. <laughs> His dream was to host The Tonight Show, right? And then that whole big mess happened with Leno. And he actually got the chance to host The Tonight Show if he waited six months and then Leno would leave and then he would get it, but he didn't want to be the guy who replaced Leno. So anyway, he ended up saying no to what his dream was. But did he really? Because he still got a nighttime show that was on at 1130. It's, your success is a line. So if I, like, I knew that I wanted to be on the radio. I went for NPR, but it didn't have to be NPR. I could have gone to commercial radio. I could have found some other way to do it. I knew that I wanted to be doing TV news, but it didn't have to be CNN. I could have been a lot of different places. And if in the end I tried all these different places and they didn't work, then I would have started an online one. You can, as long as you remember that there's infinite points on a line, simple math, you realize that there are infinite ways for you to get to that point of success. And if you keep up the effort and you find that one tiny little opportunity and you just cups and ice the heck out of it, your kids and your family will learn how, uh, how awesome you are. But also, ultimately, they'll learn that they should have supported you in the first place. Um, question, do you feel the dads that could do a better job at being a parent have ultimately taken advantage of the stigma and or are a product of the stigma? Good one. OK, let me read that to you again because you don't have it, okay. Do you feel the dads in that could do a better job of being a parent have ultimately taken advantage of the stigma and or are a product of the stigma? Uh, well, we're all affected by the stigmas, but I have a chapter in the book in which I talk about two things, um, male privilege and female gatekeeping. So male privilege is what this question refers to. Now, because of the way that we're raised, we, we can easily fall into these norms on our own when we grow up. We can be like, you know what, honey? I think changing the diaper right now really is more your thing. It's more a mom thing. Go ahead, you do that. Um, that's male privilege. We can fall into it. And just as bad as female gatekeeping, in which the, the woman says, you know what? You, you're doing it wrong. You're changing the baby wrong. You're going to drop the baby. You're going to hurt the baby. That's not how you do it. Give me the baby. And I see those things play out all the time. And we, we all have to watch out for this stuff. Um, you know, there are men who say that they couldn't, didn't get a chance to care for their newborns because their mother-in-law wouldn't let them. Because in that generation, men didn't change diapers, and like they really believe the man's going to drop the baby. So sometimes you you have to, like you have to fight for you know your right to be a parent. Um, so yes, I mean we can all fall into these things, and it starts really young. You know there is no reason to be afraid of men, but there is a popular fear of men. You know dads who are on the playground. They, it's in my book, but they've all had the same experience where you, you, as a dad you take your kids to the playground. There are certain women who are like. Why is it man out here? And they kind of close off their circle and don't want to talk to you. That's starting to change, but they've all had that experience. Men who wanted to join the at-home parent groups but were told they couldn't because they're men. So then these men end up feeling ostracized. And, and all these things come from the way that we're raised with these stigmas. There isn't an actual biological reason that when a kid turns 12, if they're a girl, they can babysit for a baby, but if they're a boy, they can't. That's actually, and I mean, everyone, it's up to everyone who cares for kids. But the idea is that like boys actually can babysit for babies, and so can girls. And boys aren't going to drop babies if they're responsible people. It's all about the individual and reaching that point of responsibility and raising your kids to understand that you really, everyone should go back and listen to that album, Free to Be You and Me. That we really, Free to Be You and Me. That you really, we really are, by nature, equally capable of nurturing. And there's nothing unmanly or um, manly or nothing unfeminine or particularly feminine about it. It's, it's human. You know, the best thing we can do as parents, I've learned, there's a great line. The best thing we can do as parents, my therapist told me this years ago. Um, I should see him. That's like the last time I saw him. But he, he, said, he said, parenthood is about setting the best possible example for how to be a human being. It's such a great line. And we all have the capacity to do that. What advice can you give to people, entrepreneurs who don't fit into a mold and who want to take the step to create their own opportunities? Um, I encourage everyone to do that. Everyone to be an entrepreneur, even within your business, you know, even within your company. Create something. Um, but how, how, my advice is, first of all, to 
start off with the vertical learning curve. If there's something that you feel you want to do, always start off learning. The biggest mistake people make is they get so anxious for their shot at creating what they want to create that they forget they first need to know how to do it. You know, like what if Phoebe had gotten that, that party, but she didn't actually like know how to handle dry ice and she started a fire. No one would ever let her ever be in a party again. You have to learn what you do. So with me, when I wanted to get on the radio, I didn't just focus on please put me on the radio. I spent months I mean, I had no money. I was selling tickets at night at a comedy club, at a comedy club, the punchline, um, and, and like getting by on like very little money and, and learning how to do this stuff. So number one is vertical learning curve. And then number two is going searching for an opportunity anywhere in which it doesn't have to be that actual thing, just something related to it, anything related to it. And when you do something related to it, you can take that one little thing and you can make it big. Get it into the company newsletter that you just did this. Make sure everyone knows about it. Get some great tweet where someone says, I love that you did this, and just blow it up and share it with everyone you know, and contact the local paper and have them do a story about it. This is where there's so many ways to snowball it, but number one is always to learn first. Any specific practices for work-life balance? Do you have specific practices for work-life balance? Um, yes. So for my book, I asked a lot of men and women, how stretched out do you feel on a scale of one to ten? And I said, imagine that one is like a tiny little pencil point, and 10 is the love child of Elastigirl and Stretch Armstrong, which is like the largest. I said, imagine, like, where do you fall? And almost everyone said that they feel stretched out 8, 9, or 10, because we all feel really stretched out these days. So how do you find work-life balance? For me, it's about checking, checking in with yourself, which we don't do very often. And that's a great therapy line that I learned when I covered... Um, I went to uh, Denver to cover that horrible tragedy, the shooting at um, the Aurora Movie Theater. And I interviewed therapists who go around to the worst tragedies in the world. I was like, how do you keep giving people therapy when you travel to all these horrible things? Don't you go crazy? And they explained to me what they do and how it's something everyone should do. It's about checking in with yourself. So a lot of people have actual like mannerisms. Like whoever was saying earlier, if she was getting close to her computer, it made her sick. Like in time, time to do something about that. A lot of us have, um, some of the guys in my book said that they find themselves playing video games like obsessively. And that's when they realize, whoa, I'm trying to process some of my own anxieties. When you come to understand, check in with yourself and see like, how's your body responding? How are you responding? Are you sleeping well? These basic physical things, all of a sudden you're forced to confront, oh, I am doing too much of this and I'm worried too much about that. And when you do that, you have to act like, kind of like your own doctor. Like, give yourself a prescription. I will do this, and I won't do this, and actually stick to it. I know it's not easy, but stick to it. Uh, for those of us who own our business, what can we do outside of the workforce to make this change? Um, okay, so by the change, I assume you mean the, the gender equality stuff. Yeah, I mean, now I ended up leaving CNN after my book came out because all these new opportunities came along. So I'm right now technically a one-person business. I own my own business. Um, so what can we do? So when your business is small, I'll, I'll tell you, this is why I like to start off with that story about my grandfather, because I would never want any policies or laws or anything that would make it tougher for him to do business. You know, this is why I say I don't want some, some like new regulation that tells all businesses of all sizes you have to provide like money in the following ways. A lot of them can't. Um, but what you can do is learn to set aside your own gender-based expectations. So when you work with contractors, and not just gender, race too. When, when, you, when you work with contractors, if you are hiring, if you're hiring a temp, it, is, it actually takes work to set aside the assumptions that we make about each other. You see a person and you don't even realize you're making assumptions. And I don't mean this in a didactic way, I have to do it too. You know, like you see a person, and due to being human, we le have learned to do certain things. I see their race, or what their race might be, or the shade of their skin. I, I see their gender. I also see their hair, and what they're wearing, and, and how they're presenting themselves. And I can make a lot of assumptions. And I have this mantra that I use in my mind now. I say to myself, the only things you know about this person are what you know about this person. And when you say that to yourself, you realize, whoa, I literally don't know any of the things that I was just assuming. And that gets at this. The more that we can set those things aside and start seeing people as individuals, small businesses can be an absolute part of this, the more we can make that change. Also in the book, I show you how, as small businesses, you are the most in need of a public paid family leave system. Because right now, big, pump, big companies, can they have more money to work with in the short term. So they can offer someone, here, take 10 paid weeks off. You probably can't offer that. But when you have a public system, uh, you don't have to. While they're off, 
they're paid through that fund, which pays for itself because everyone's paying into it, and then they come back to work. So what you really need to do is work for this societal, totally nonpartisan solution to get public paid family leave in America so we can stop being that one nation in deep red on that map. What stigmas do father face, fathers face when showing affection to their children in public spaces? Yes, thank you for asking that. Dads all over the country have faced this. I have. Your kids, let's say, crying, because sometimes kids cry. And people start looking at you thinking, what if you're a kidnapper? Like, it's, it's, I mean, it's amazing. So we really need, and so then that can make like some dads be like extra worried about like what if they are seen being close to their kids or holding their kids a certain way, like a normal way, like the way you hold a baby. Um, so what, what we need in, in, these are stigmas that men face in, in public spaces. They face, um, they face fear, which is often not, and they also face, uh, compliments that are actually based on offensive stereotypes. Like, oh, you're, you're out with the kids today. You're doing a good job of Mr. Mom. No, like I'm not Mr. Mom. It's not like that's my mom, the mom's job. I'm, I'm parent. Um, or when someone says like, oh, your wife is so lucky that you're taking care of the kids. It's like, thank you. I know you mean that well, but would you ever say that to her? Like, it, you know, you're so, it, uh, so, so we have to all get past these kinds, of, um, these kinds of assumptions, that there's something unique or special or strange um, about a man caring for his kids. The more we can normalize it, the better. So the more we see images of dads out there just like caring for their kids, the better. And that's why, bring this full circle, that's why those ads that I showed you at the beginning matter. So now I told you, ultimately, it would all make sense. Every time we reinforce this notion through pop culture, you know, through movies and TV shows that like dads are really less parents than moms are. Uh, we make it a lot tougher for women in the workplace because work, work leaders and government leaders believe we really need to make sure the mom's at home. And this is proven repeatedly. Bosses who have a guy, a man and a woman who work for them, if like that someone needs to stay late, they'll often just say, and they're both parents, they'll say, you know what, you, you, he'll go home. I mean, you go home, you go home. He, he'll stay at work. Your kids need you at home. Go ahead at home. So the woman loses the work opportunity, and then when the next uh, promotion comes along, guess who's going to get it? The guy who was given that project. So getting past the idea that there's anything strange about men being caregivers is big. Um, question, the number of men working with childcare or working with young children has largely remained unchanged in over 30 years. Do you believe this is due to the painfully low salary or is something deeper to blame? How can we encourage more men to work in professions that help young children? Yes, you're totally right. There are far too few male teachers, particularly for younger kids. And that is a big problem. And part of it is money, yes. I mean, this is where you look at the big macro stuff. The wage gap between men and women hurts men too. You know, and this is something no one ever thinks about. The, the wage gap sucks for the entire family. The man ends up putting in more work hours because they need more money and he's getting paid more. And the woman is less likely to put in more work hours, less likely to advance her career, more pressure on the man to work more. So yes, a very often what you have among teachers is that there are female teachers who have husbands that are making more money. And so they can afford to be teachers. And when men are still expected to make more money, when you still have these structures in which men are less likely to find wives who make more money because of the wage gap, you're making it tougher. So yeah, we, need, we should be paying teachers more anyway. I mean, the, the, the current, yeah. <laughs> really, I mean, yeah, it's, and it is too bad. And also just encouraging it and getting more men involved in, the, in these public spaces. Because as much as I can talk about this, a lot of these old traditional gender norm ideas that like boys don't cry, boys, you know, all these things um, are still out there in public spaces. And we need more men out there being healthy human beings in front of boys in all those spaces, including as their teachers. My son had a second grade teacher who was a man. He was so psyched. I was psyched. It was great. And my time's almost up, but I have more questions. This is good. What is your stance on states that have work at will employment laws like Georgia? Yes, Idaho is a work at will state. This means there is no set length for an employment relationship and either the employer or the employee may end it at any time with or without notice, with or without cause. Well, um, okay, so this is about at will. Everyone know what at will? Okay, what at will is? I assume you do. Georgia, where I live, is an at will state uh, as well. What a lot of people don't realize is that even in an at will state, you actually cannot be fired for certain reasons. 
People think at will means you can do whatever you want. You can't. There are certain federal protections. And what I invoked when I took legal action to change the policy at, at Time Warner, I invoked my legal protections. I didn't file a lawsuit. A lot of people, the headlines said I sued. I've never filed a lawsuit. What I did was I invoked my rights um, uh, under uh, the uh, labor, uh, Title VII. So there, there are labor rights, employment rights in this country. And I filed a, a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. And when you do that, um, nowhere in the country can you ever be fired for filing a charge with the EEOC. You also cannot be fired um, for because of your race or your religion or your gender, even in an at-will state. So you do still have uh, rights, and it's important to invoke those rights if that comes up. If you are fired because of your gender, and, you know it can be tough to prove. Um, but if you're fired because of that, then you do have the right to um, to take legal action. Another thing we need, though, and I write about this in the book, is called uh, family responsibility discrimination laws. They're popping up all over the country, including in this region, in which more and more towns, even small towns, cities, states, are creating laws saying you cannot discriminate against someone in the workplace because they have caregiving responsibilities. And that makes it even easier for businesses to learn and people to learn not to have that prejudice. You know, I, I, ultimately, a lot of these things don't sound like it, but they're really pro-business. Because the idea is, let's help take away all the fears people have. Have. Let's take away the fear that people have that if I talk to my boss about my struggle, I might get fired for it. Let's take away the fear that um, if, I talk, if I make a suggestion, I might be punished for it. That's off the table. You can't be. So let's have real conversations. And then those conversations can flourish because right now, men and women often leave their jobs instead of having those conversations first because they're not aware that they have these protections. All right, I know that's a lot of words from me. Thank you all so much for listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you.